I had a chance to read a book the other day. It had contagion in its title. It talked about the world changing in front of us. And it talked about a situation in which we have tremendous job losses, much unemployment, and people not having enough work and not having enough to return to. And under that scenario, there was a wide swath of the population that became dependent on government assistance because people just couldn't survive without that governmental assistance. In fact, the, the book talked about the possibility of having some kind of payments to people something like universal basic income that uh, Andrew Yang talked about during the presidential campaign. And as a result of all the spending on people to make sure that they survived, um, they, the government went into a great deficit and we already had a deficit to begin with. And um, now this just made everything worse. And you can imagine the national and global social dislocation from all of that. The interesting aspect of that book is that it was written in 2019, not 2020, was not talking about COVID. It was talking about artificial intelligence and the impact that artificial intelligence will have on people. So even before the COVID-19 incident that we've had, the global pandemic, people were worried about the kinds of things that we're seeing with COVID-19, except that it had to do with artificial intelligence. I also want to tell, flip back to the 1990s, I want to tell you a story, which is I was having breakfast one day and I was having Frosted Flakes, as a matter of fact. And this was around the time of the very beginning of the internet. It was like 90, 1994, 1995, something like that. And people around the office where I worked, they thought the internet was kind of a, a fun thing or that it was a, it was a hobby. As some hobbyists were getting into it, but People didn't really take it that seriously at the time, but I thought this is a really important development. And I was just eating my Frosted Flakes and lo and behold, what I saw was a URL. This is, this is today's Frosted Flakes, but on, on the day that I saw this, this box, I saw a URL and I said, wow, this is real. This is not just a fad. This is not just a hobby. This is real business. And I think this is going to make a tremendous impact on society. So fast forward to today's uh, world or more recent world. I had Frosted Flakes moments when as I'm pumping gas at the 76 station in Los Altos, I'm seeing these autonomous vehicles going up and down the street. And it happens to be that I live down the street from, uh, I live near San Antonio Road and San Antonio Road is where the Waymo garages, the Waymo is this uh, uh, subsidiary of Alphabet, which is part of the Google uh, um, enterprise. So Waymo wakes up, uh, it used to be Google, now it's Way Waymo, they call themselves, the autonomous vehicle division calls themselves Waymo, and their garage is down the street. So I'm seeing these, these vans going up and down the street constantly. Uh, um, and so I feel like I'm in the autonomous vehicle capital of the world. So that... Uh, Steve, can I interrupt you? Um, so it looks like the slides aren't advancing like we did in the prep. Um, uh, do you see on your screen that your yours are advancing? Yeah. Let's do it this way. Oh, you did. Okay. Now, now it looks like they did work. It is. Okay, yeah. I don't know if you saw the frosted flakes, but this is the URL. <laughs> um, but uh, this is this is the um, this is the the Waymo van that people see, and um, I, I, I tell people I live in the the, the autonomous vehicle capital world, but we live in a, a world full of robots, and we have these. Like at the top, we have the, the, the suitcase robot or the telepresence robot or the, the sweeper that sweeps your floors. Uh, it may be that if baseball will be hauling balls and strikes at some point with robots. And this um, James Bond film was filmed with um, a drone. So uh, we're using them all the time. We have artificial intelligence systems for ferreting out fraud and doing our banking and automated trading systems. But... One of, th one of the things I think about is the importance of artificial intelligence. And when I, I read uh, Stuart Russell's book this year, uh, this past year, he wrote the premier textbook on artificial intelligence. And this is what he said about artificial intelligence. It's pervasive today, dominant in the future. And if we have uh, super intelligence or artificial general intelligence, it would be the biggest event in human history. 
And I, I saw uh, another, I read another book, Kai-Fu Lee's book. He's a venture capitalist in China. He's started a lot of companies to work for Google, Microsoft, and Apple. And this is what he said about artificial intelligence. Changed the world more than anything in the history of mankind, more than electricity. So this is a big development in our society. And we're just getting started. We're just in its infancy. But what I tell people about, uh, when I give these talks, I say, we have artificial intelligence robotics today. It's here. It's growing. And it's going to have a tremendous impact. Now, that some of that impact is going to be tremendously positive, miraculous in some views. And in other aspects of it, it's going to have terrifying results. And we're going to have a lot of legal result, legal issues as a result of all these developments. And all of us play a role to make sure that the development, the sale, the purchase, the operation of artificial intelligence and robotic systems take place with an, in an ethical legally compliant and safe manner. So what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is a field of computer science. It uh, is believed to have started in the 1956 Dartmouth conference with some academics who started thinking about being able to automate uh, human uh, um, processes. And I like to think of AI, the shorthand definition is machine simulating features of human intelligence. It may, it, it, the machines perceive some action in the world, perceive some data, like it's video or audio, they figure out what's going on and then they take action as, res, as, as in response. It's not consciousness in human sense, but it's processing information and then taking action based on it. And this is, this is a big deal. So um, we, we, we take it seriously. But when we talk about what, what does an artificial intelligence and robotics lawyer do, my, this, is, this is what my practice looks like. I help companies with their transactions. So it may be a, a robot sale uh, contract. It may be uh, helping to negotiate a, a software as a service agreement where uh, the AI is being delivered as a software um, service. I, I work on compliance where I tell companies what you need to do to comply with specific laws, so, some of which are AI specific, some of which are more general. I help companies think about liability and, and there, are, there are litigation cases about this stuff. I'm working on one case right now having to do with the, the claim that a, a robotic system doesn't work as advertised and the other side says, yes, it does. So we, we have a dispute over, over whether the robotic technology is actually working. Um, liability can also mean accidents and data breaches. Uh, I'm also working on investigations and incident response, a lot of data breaches, not not having to do with robotics necessarily, but working on data breaches. And then um, in the future, we're going to have AI incidents where some biased outcome occurred. And so you have to look into what happened, what went wrong, or there might be an autonomous vehicle accident. So these would be examples of this. And then governance. Today, I'm running a lot of privacy policies and security policies. But in the future, we'll be talking about AI impact assessments or AI impact statements. So this is what an AI law practice looks like today. But to give you a concrete idea of what we're talking about, I'm going to quickly go through some examples of technology. There's nothing better to understand how the technology works uh, and, and what, is the, what is the technology than to show you examples and explain a little bit of examples. When I'm telling you these examples, remember also that what we're talking about is the infancy of, of AI and robotics in a lot of ways. Even though we've had it for decades, we're still getting started with things. I, I hearken back on an example to say, I don't know if you remember from the 1970s, you used to play Pong, the video game. Well, nowadays video games are almost photorealistic. That's the difference that a few decades can make in terms of the development of a particular technology. So what I'm showing you is the equivalent of the Pong games. It's not very advanced compared to what we're going to have in future decades. So when we think about artificial intelligence, a lot of people think that this is what we're talking about, the Terminator scenario, but that's not actually what we're talking about. What we're talking about are things like driverless cars. I showed you the Waymo vans at the beginning. That's the current iteration of Google's autonomous vehicles, uh, Google Waymo. This is an older Waymo vehicle. The interesting thing about this uh, driverless car is the person who's operating it is legally blind and he's able to operate the car. Tesla is an, an ex another example of automation. It's an advanced driver assistance system. It's not meant to substitute completely for human judgment. Humans are supposed to still pay attention on the road, but a lot of people can just 
uh, monitor the system, hold their hands on the wheel and let the car drive itself. We, we are at that point with the Tesla vehicles. We may have future modes of automation. Bill, you may be interested to know that um, there's a company in Santa Cruz that's working on a drone to carry people almost like a helicopter yeah. uh, take off and landing drone <laughs> to yeah. go from um, Santa Cruz into San Jose. So that that's, that's the kind of future mode of transportation we would have. Mm -hmm. And of course, AI would help to, to navigate um, these, these vehicles. Uh, in terms of robotics, Amazon wants to deliver packages to your doorstep by air. We're not quite that, at that point in terms of FAA authorization to allow those types of deliveries to happen. This was a 60 minutes segment where uh, Jeff Bezos was talking about their ambition to do, uh, Amazon's ambition to do that. But if it's not by air, maybe it's by, dr by ground. I took this picture at, when we were doing a, a college visit at the University of Pittsburgh. The Starship Technologies has these little ground drones that are delivering things to people and, and running around the campus. You could fit about two bags of groceries inside of that. Um, Service robots. We will, this is a Boston Dynamics Atlas robot that can lift things and move things around a warehouse setting. Uh, Stanford Mall has a security robot that looks kind of like this that's taking video and audio and people who are monitoring that video feed and audio feed can uh, become alerted if something is going wrong. We have warehouse robots. This is uh, an Amazon uh, warehouse where these uh, vehicles can move um, uh, stacks of things around the warehouse to make uh, move packages to where they get to the point where they're packed and delivered. We'll have autonomous farm equipment like this combine here that people can control with their mobile phones to make farming more efficient. Or around the house, it could be a sweeper, it could be a lawnmower, something like that, where we have uh, the autonomous uh, household service robot. In, in um, this was taken, I believe, in the Narita Airport in, in Japan, where you have a, a concierge robot to help you around um, to, to find shops within the airport or to um, find a place to eat. There's one in San Jose Airport as well. Um, retail robots would help you in the future to be able to pick out clothes, help direct you to particular uh, products that you're looking for. Um, this is a picture I took in the San Francisco airport. This is a, a robotic arm that can make all kinds of coffee drinks. So it's an automated coffee kiosk and, and it's here today. Um, inventory robots are tracking packages, uh, are tracking uh, inventory to find out, okay, we need to order more of this product or that product. So it would go up and down the aisles and monitor the, the shelves to see whether it, uh, people need to add more to the shelves. And we have uh, the Pepper robot, SoftBank's Pepper robot that is like a mascot, it, 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 it can uh, do things uh, like, when you walk into the bank in, in Belgium, there's a, a, there might be a pepper robot that says, hey, do you, uh, uh, greetings and welcome to our bank and are you interested in opening a savings account? Siri, everybody knows Siri, Cortana, Alexa, we've got these electronic agents that do things for us, they can play music, they can answer trivia questions, they can order products for us. So we, we, these electronic agents are becoming more and more powerful all the time. These are driven by artificial intelligence. Uh, Erica is, is this uh, image here. Erica is the Bank of America um, automated chatbot that can help you uh, when you use your mobile app, the Bank of America mobile app, you, would, you might wanna ask, what's my savings account balance today? Um, or can I apply for this credit card? Something like that. So Erica will help you out with those kinds of things. You can apply for loans and um, get evaluated for possible uh, credit uh, by, with automated, automated processes today. And of course, IBM has Watson. So they're using Watson for a lot of uh, very complicated problems. You, you may have heard about Watson competing on Jeopardy. That was sort of a, a showcase project, but it also does a lot of things like working in the healthcare field to help out with differential diagnosis. So we have very large scale artificial intelligence systems that are um, helping to uh, do uh, all kinds of tasks today. We'll talk about some like uh, automated trading systems to uh, buy and trade stocks. Uh, when certain price points are hit, uh, the algorithm knows to buy or to sell, something like that. Uh, there's this company is called Beam and it is involved in authenticating people who are uh, doing business over the internet and also trying to ferret out money laundering. 
So it's using artificial intelligence to notice patterns of fraud. There's something called robotic process automation. This means taking a manual business process and having um, automation and an artificial intelligence be able to do it. It might be something like processing checks in the back office when a bank is trying to clear a check um, and having, having the software do that process where it used to be that humans used to do that process. So it's making business back office functions a lot more um, efficient. We're starting to use artificial intelligence for investigations. So you can, matter, you can imagine a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act investigation where the machines are trying to find patterns of unauthorized payments like bribes, and it can notice by looking at transactional data some patterns that might indicate uh, patterns of fraud that can then be looked into by human investigators. I like to tell the story about a Target where um, a young woman received a, a postcard in the mail. It was for paternity wear. And her father was totally incensed, complained to Target and basically said, how dare you send this card to my daughter? She is just a teenager. Well, as it turns out, Target knew before dad did that his teen daughter was actually expecting at that time. And Target noticed the pattern of behavior of her purchases and made an inference that maybe she was expecting and then set, for that reason sent her the card. I also wanted to, if you could take a look at the screen for a second, um, there's something called generative adversarial networks. The person who appears in this photo is actually not real. This was generated by a computer based on digesting many photos and then spitting out new examples of people's faces. And this is a process, I won't go into the technical details, but um, this is a, uh, these types of artificial intelligence systems are generative adversarial networks. Um, that is, you have kind of have two networks competing to make each other better, to create better and better images of something or better facsimiles of something. And the way it's shaking out is people are using GANs to create fake videos and pictures, obviously. This was an example of a picture, but this would be uh, a video. And I, I'm not going to show you the video, but... Um, uh, Jordan Peele, who's a comedian, recorded audio, and uh, the audio was playing while the video of President Obama was apparently moving his mouth in sync with the, the sound that Peele was making. And Peele essentially made Barack Obama say things that he otherwise wouldn't say. So this is a, a big concern for the government. It's, it's something that people are worried about in the future. Imagine if we had a fake video of some national leader saying things that were totally incendiary, it could create chaos as a result of that. Um, we also have Im immense amounts of data from smart and connected devices like a pacemaker, smart city applications, home applications, your automobile, smart meters, and retail settings. So all of these are, are creating a lot of data which then can then be digested by artificial intelligence systems and predictions made or recommendations made or actions taken. In the medical field, artificial intelligence has and, and robotics have big applications. So this is a, a smart scalpel when as the tissue is cutting around a cancerous lesion, the scalpel is ingesting the tissue and a machine is basically saying, uh, okay, you're cutting outside of the lesion now, or you're still in the lesion. So it can kind of help the guide the surgeon to cut only the lesion. Um, we are using artificial intelligence to do fast genomic sequencing, to be able to identify potential genetic uh, abnormalities that may lead to problems. And um, there's a, a, a famous book called Deep Medicine. Um, uh, Dr. Eric Topol wrote the book. And he talks about at the beginning of the story of a, a young boy who's like eight days old. Um, he had some seizures and the doctors were able to do some fast genetic sequencing and figure out what it was, what genetic abnormality he had and basically saved his life as a result of this, this fast uh, uh, genetic sequencing. We have surgical robots that can do uh, uh, operations in a much more precise fashion than humans can with their, their hands. This, this particular robot is uh, now owned by Johnson & Johnson. This company is owned by Johnson & Johnson. It, it sends a probe into your lungs to the endpoints of your, of your lungs to be able to collect biopsy samples. And the, the robot is guided through uh, your lungs with the help of a human. 
we will also in Japan, people are very interested in elder care because the younger generation isn't necessarily around to help older folks. So creating robots to help lift people up and uh, put them back down uh, and carry them around. Those, those kinds of robots are, are under development in Japan right now. In the hospital setting, we also have these robots that can take bed sheets and supplies from one area of the hospital to another without a human having to do that. We, and, and think about today's uh, COVID virus. Uh, we have these telepresence medical robots where somebody in the examining room can put a stethoscope on a patient and a doctor who is remote, doesn't have to be exposed to the patient, can talk to the patient and then watch the readings or hear the readings, hear the stethoscope um, sounds th remotely through um, this, this telepresence. Uh, and, and in China, there is actually a hospital that is being completely, uh, there, there are people there in the hospital, but there are many robots that are taking over the functions of human beings to prevent exposure to COVID-19. The one on the left is carrying things around the hospital. The one on the right is more of a, a mascot robot. It will bring food to people. It will dance for people. This, so they're doing a little dance on the right side, kind of entertaining people, raise their spirits. But there are many applications for artificial intelligence in medicine, predicting people's lifespan, predicting the usage of hospital uh, resources, uh, watching uh, uh, people around the, the hospital to make sure that they're washing their hands properly, even monitoring people, uh, differential diagnosis, trying to figure out uh, who, what people have in terms of their conditions looking at clinical studies to find out which clinical studies might be applicable to particular clinical patients. There are many possible applications. The, the book Deep Medicine, I recommend it in case you're interested in this area of artificial intelligence. And in, uh, when you talk about the COVID-19 virus, people are looking at artificial intelligence to track what's going on, predict, predict progression. Uh, and, and there's a system in China that can look at people's faces and, and they're trying to detect whether people have fever or not. There, Stanford has a system to try to monitor um, respiratory function and sleep patterns of elder folks who might be at risk with COVID-19. So the human-centered uh, AI uh, program within Stanford is, is trying to develop this as a research project. And then looking at trying to create new treatments to, to accelerate the process of new treatments and vaccine discovery. So AI is, is working even with COVID-19. We'll have nanobots at some point within, within uh, the next decades that will flow through our bloodstream to help deliver medication or to do diagnosis of illness um, and to image whatever's going on. So little, we, we were trying to move into the area of, of nanotechnology to help us with, with medical care. Someday you may have a chatbot type doctor uh, to help screen you so that if you talk to the chatbot, uh, artificial doctor might say, okay, that doesn't sound serious, or maybe if this does sound serious, you need to be seen, something like that to do some, some checking on the front end. So that might come, come around someday. Also, um, in terms of robotics, the people that you see here are paralyzed from the neck down, but through their thoughts alone, they can manipulate this arm and the woman on the left is feeding herself and the, the man on the right is uh, having his robotic hand shake President Obama's hand. So this was at the University of Pittsburgh and um, they're doing a research project on, on these thought controlled prostheses. Uh, the University of Washington has a, a, a program to study brain, uh, the, the interface between brain and information technology. The, these people were wired together remotely. They're, they have sensors on their heads and the person on the left uh, thinks press the button and the person on the right, his finger press the button like this brain to brain connection through the internet. Um, this is just a sort of primitive proof of concept kind of thing, but we're trying to connect people's uh, nervous systems to information technology, which may enhance the, our memories, enhance our processing power someday. Th uh, there was an experiment recently done uh, where some people were uh, helping to, uh, the, the person on the right was playing a video game, sort of like Tetris, and the people on the left could see the same images and were thinking, making recommendations, which appeared in the mind of the person on the right, and, and this person could take that into account in playing Tetris. So we're trying to connect brains even with, uh, with uh, information technology, and, so, and we will have neural devices for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's treatment. 
So these are all the, the examples that I wanted to show you. And why are these happening like this right now? Well, we are having great increases in computing power. If you look at the trend over time, computing power is increasing exponentially. At the same time, prices are falling dramatically. So that gives us more horsepower to be able to do things with uh, AI systems and robots that we just couldn't do in prior generations. When you look at how artificial intelligence and robotics are working together, think also about all the related technologies that work together with it. And, the, and with this view in mind, think about the example of an autonomous vehicle. It's a robot. It may have access to your social networking systems when it has a tablet computer in the dashboard. It's a mobile computer. It's receiving a lot of data and it's throwing off a lot of data at the same time. It's connected to the internet of things by uh, cloud computing that's connected uh, and, and there might be a cloud system that's it's, uh, with, with central storage. It may have an augmented reality screen so you can look down the street and say, oh, uh, that building over there has my favorite coffee shop. I, I think I ought to navigate there. It may be using the very latest privacy and security technologies and someday it will be connected to our body area network devices so that if somebody has a heart attack, the autonomous vehicle knows to take you to the hospital instead of wherever else you wanted to uh, go. But the point of all of that is to say that endpoint, the car and all the devices associated with it are part of a, a phenomenon of ambient intelligence, intelligence everywhere. This is the trend that we're heading towards. All of our endpoint devices and increasingly things that we didn't normally think of as intelligent, like our refrigerators or um, devices in the walls or our desks will increasingly have devices that could sense, that could uh, gather, collect data, send it to the cloud, uh, allow us to use those cloud services to be able to make predictions or to understand what's going on. Um, and intelligence will increasingly be everywhere. So what could possibly go wrong with all of these things? This is, this is a picture I took, if you can believe it, at the Pittsburgh National Airport that had a, um, a, an exhibit, like a museum type of exhibit, like a robot workshop. And um, I thought it was, it was a pretty cool thing. But um, we, when we think about legal issues that could arise from all of this, what, what are we talking about? Well, uh, these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. I, I, I mentioned uh, autonomous vehicle accidents, but it could be medical malpractice dealing with a lot of uh, data breaches in the non-AI world, but we're going to have uh, data breaches in the AI world as well. In your program materials that I gave you was my most recent white paper that I wrote last month that talked about some lawsuits that have been filed uh, over the, uh, the, the claim that um, some founders of a company, uh, OkCupid, um, were invested in another company and the, these founders took perhaps without authorization, took the database of OkCupid uh, photographs of, of users and then gave it to this other company for facial recognition for training the AI system. Now, was that a data breach? That, that, that litigation hasn't revealed whether, whether the allegation is that it was a data breach or not, but uh, there is a complaint about the possible unauthorized use of those photographs from OkCupid, which is a dating site. So there, there are all kinds of problems that, that you can see here on the screen that, that could go wrong from a legal perspective. Um, but let's, let's focus on some of the, the issues, the, the main issues that we're, we're talking about. Like, let's start with compliance. So um, we have autonomous driving laws. All but 10 states have either a statute on point or a, governmental, uh, a governor's executive order that talks about how to make autonomous driving happen in particular states. So if you're doing compliance work in the area of AI and robotics, maybe one of the things you'll be doing is advising your clients about autonomous driving laws. Where is it legal? What can you do in that particular state? Um, we also have a new law in the past year. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, act in Illinois that basically says, if you as an employer are doing uh, video interviews and you're using an AI system to uh, understand uh, patterns within those AI, uh, within those video interviews, and you're using AI system ju to judge job candidates, then you have to provide a notice of the, the privacy practices of the employer, provide an explanation of the technology and what characteristics are used to make judgments about, about job candidates. And then there's a right of erasure and uh, there's, there's limits on the, the sharing of that information. So um, this, this is maybe a trend where we'll have more type, 
uh, point solutions, you could call them, of artificial intelligence laws that take care of particular problems. And in California, we also had a uh, recent bot disclosure law that uh, this is to try to get at the, the, um, the 2016 election problem that we, we had when we had automated bots that were trying to convince people with fake content on social media sites to vote in particular ways. It's basically unlawful to do, do that in California. It's not clear how this is going to be enforced or what the penalties are, but it, it's, it's declared as being unlawful. Um, and you can have a safe harbor if you say, this is an automated bot that's telling you this, and this account is being run by an automated bot. Um, uh, more general laws also apply in the compliance area. So think about the, artificial, uh, the general data protection regulation, the privacy and security law in Europe. Basically, there's a right of explanation so that if, let's say, a bank denies somebody a loan, the human has the right of explanation to understand why did I get rejected for that loan? And there's also a right to insist that a human give a second look the right of human inter intervention to make sure that the bank gets a human involved and says, oh, I, I, I'll check over this again. Doesn't mean the decision has to be turned around, but at least the, the individual data subject who is rejected has the right to an explanation and the right of human intervention. We also have, uh, at, starting on January 1st, 2020, the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, and it covers a lot of the companies that may be doing artificial intelligence work with personal data. So if you have records of 50,000 or more California households, uh, individuals, households, or devices, then you're covered by the law and you have to provide certain information on notice, uh, on privacy notices or privacy policies. You have to provide certain individual rights of access to information. Um, the data subject that California resident can ask, what information did you collect about me? To whom did you share, with whom did you share it? To whom did you sell it? that kind of information, and there is a, a right of erasure. I want you to delete the personal information you have about me. Of course, there are exceptions to that. And um, there's a, a rule against discrimination for California residents who exercise their right. The company can't charge higher prices for people who exercise their individual rights. We also have a connected device law in California. And you'll have the, the slides and my program materials have the, the citation, so you don't have to, to note these down. But there's a connected device law in California that basically says you have to have a reasonable security feature to protect that device if it's going to be internet connected. So you can think robots are gonna to have to have those types of security features because these are internet of things devices, which is what the law was aimed at. And um, any device that's connected to the internet directly or indirectly um, through IP or Bluetooth um, is covered. There's also an Oregon statute similar to this. Consumer protection laws are a big hammer for plaintiff's lawyers who are going after AI and robotics companies. It may be an un, a different type of unfair and deceptive trade practice under the laws that you see here, maybe false advertising. These are the, the California statutes that would be on point. Um, there were certainly state laws in other states that, that focus on this as well. But a lot of the claims that you, we see uh, against companies for uh, doing bad things with AI systems or not taking good care of data would be covered by these, uh, some of the causes of action that plaintiffs are bringing are based on these consumer protection laws. We also have, when, let's, let's switch now to talk about transactions. What kinds of transactions are we talking about when we're doing AI and robotic transactions? Well, these are the kinds of things that, that, that you see on the screen here are, are the transactions that I'm working on. Um, there are concerns about who owns the data, uh, what, uh, and I mentioned software as a service being uh, AI based. So it's AI as a service instead of just software as a service types of transactions. Um, instead of on-premises software being installed, you've got a server somewhere that's running the software and people are gaining access to it. Uh, we ha will have robot sales agreements. We, we already do have robot sales agreements that um, people are working on. These will become more common over time. And it may be that um, we'll have more marketing agreements. If you're dealing with personal data also, you do need to have privacy and security data processing agreements to make sure that information is being protected by the recipients of that information in your business deals. What about liability? We talked about liability types of claims. Well, these are, these are very typical claims that are being brought by companies against manufacturers that um, build um, robotic systems that have accidents. Um, and, and even uh, there's a difference between the types of claims based on whether there was an accident or whether the, the uh, 
the, the device is defective in some way, even though no accident occurred. So for example, there were claims against Tesla based on the autopilot system not working reliably enough that was based not on any particular accident, but saying, I paid $5,000 for this thing and it wasn't worth the $5,000 I paid for it. Even though I didn't have an accident, I was damaged in the amount of $5,000. So you have some economic loss claims as well as some accident claims. And these can add up to large amounts. If we look at some benchmarks, Toyota had the sudden acceleration litigation against it for that phenomenon. GM had an ignition switch problem where the, the ignition switched off and people had accidents while they were driving. And these ended up being $4 billion liabilities for both of these companies. So the dollars amounts for liability can be huge. So how do you prevent these kinds of problems from a risk management perspective? Well, I, in your materials is my book chapter in the Law of Artificial Intelligence and Smart Machines, where I talk about product liability and um, risk management things that you can do to try to, as if you're a manufacturer representing a manufacturer, this is what you can talk to your client about, making sure that they have a proactive safety focus, trying to take care of the problem now for a product that isn't even done, hasn't had any accidents so that you can win the lawsuit in the future. It, when the inevitable accidents do occur, making sure that there is a, a thorough risk assessment done to make, to make sure you understand what the possible risks are with the, with the product. Um, technical standards do help to make sure that you can say, at least I'm meeting the industry benchmark, but you want to go above and beyond that. Insurance coverage is important in order to make sure that you have uh, the, the ability to shift risk to an insurer so that you can uh, offer your, your product with um, the, the ability of knowing that you're managing the amount of money that you'll pay out for these claims. And then making sure that you keep in your records and information management pro uh, processes, the documents that show you tried to do the right thing and take safety into, into account. And of course, there are always these in the litigation, when the litigation does occur, there are jury consultants and defense experts that can help to you to defend these claims and specialty bars for lawyers to be able to share information. So these are the types of risk management techniques that I talk with, with, with uh, people about. And then when an incident does occur, um, these are the types of steps that you use to, to um, manage the, the events following that particular event, event. So hopefully you've planned in advance before any accident or uh, incident of bias or data breach occurs, but um, you should have a, an advanced plan. You want to detect the problem, then implement your plan when it occurs. And then you should start with an internal investigation. It's, it's helpful to maintain the attorney-client privilege to use third-party investigators that are being hired by outside counsel. You also want to preserve the evidence that's involved so that there's no spoliation of evidence. And then for data breaches in particular, it may be helpful to have law enforcement get involved to assist you in the process of going after the bad folks. The, the last area of law I talk about is governance. When I'm talking about governance, I'm talking about policies and procedures usually, and the, the policies and procedures may cover any of these items that are on, on the bulleted list near the bottom of the slide. And what, what are we talking about today? We're talking about privacy policies and security policies, but in the future, we'll be doing AI risk assessments and AI impact statements. Like if we develop this autonomous system, what's the impact on society going to be? We should be thinking about that kind of thing because there are PR implications, there are possible regulatory implications as a result of all these. And when we're talking about the types of documents that you might be helping your clients write, um, policies are the high level ones, procedures are the more day-to-day uh, -day nuts and bolts, what do we have to do to follow the policy, guidelines help people comply with the policies, you may have technical standards to understand the technology that you need, and then training materials to help people actually implement it day-to-day. So if you're saying, well, what, what does all this mean for me? What can I, I, I'm really interested in this, all this stuff. What can I do to follow up? Well, what I would say is read the, these books. The Fourth Industrial Revolution talks about a lot of different types of technologies and gives you an overview of a lot of them. And then if you really want to be frightened, if you want to see uh, the, the sobering reality of what uh, super intelligence could look like in the future, read Life 3.0 by Max Segmart, which is a tremendous book. And then I, what I tell people is, uh, uh, I have a secret, which is that I, I use my iPhone as my news source in the morning and I, I read the artificial intelligence channel and the self-driving car channel and they curate all these stories and put them in one place so that you can read and keep up, up to speed on, on all these developments. And of course, we have 
uh, in the American Bar Association. We have programs and publications. I recommend to you the, the Law of Artificial Intelligence and Smart Machines, which is a survey book. SciTech Lawyer is the uh, glossy magazine of the science and technology law section. I was chair of the section from 2010 to 2011. A lot of my articles ended up in the SciTech Lawyer. And then every year in October, we are planning to have an Artificial Intelligence and Robotics National Institute at Santa Clara University. So local for most of you. And um, uh, we'll, we'll be having another one, hopefully, if the virus allows us to happen on October 12th and 13th, 2020. In the ABA, we have got committees in the science and technology law section. One's artificial intelligence and robotics. There's another one on information security. We have ones on privacy and big data and internet of things. So there are plenty of, of committees that uh, you can get involved with. And every month I'm doing something just like this. It's a meetup. Uh, you can open a meetup account for free. And if you look for robotics, artificial intelligence and the law is the name of my meetup group. I've been doing this for five and a half years and I've got all these old programs, if you, if you look at the old programs and say, oh, that looks really interesting. If you look at the comment section, there's a link which you can click on to see the video of uh, the program, just like what we're recording today. And then, as I mentioned, we're gonna have another Artificial Intelligence Robotics National Institute. But uh, I wanted to give you an overview of some of the, the key themes that came out of the last one. And all of the issues that you see here are things that people were worried about, especially bias and uh, working uh, the uh, job loss and, and what's the standard of care? If I'm going to put an autonomous vehicle on the, on the road, how safe is safe enough? Uh, we're, we're, as a profession, we're just beginning to grapple with these kinds of questions. But I also said, what, I, what I'm perceiving is that all of us together in beginning to study this are involved in something bigger than ourselves. It's not just lawyer A achieving result X for client number one. This is helping to create something that will be society-wide by us helping our clients create safe products that are done in, uh, produced in an ethical fashion and in compliance with the law. We're helping prevent problems in the future that might affect a large swath of society. And think about in the future, not only the possibility of expanding human intelligence and moving us uh, more uh, artificial intelligence might look like something like Einstein, but in the future, AI could push humankind and, and there could be machines that go even beyond, way beyond Einstein to the point of what we call super intelligence and artificial general intelligence, referring to machines that could interact with us like data on Star Trek, the next generation, or um, machines that could interact with us and converse with us and, and seemingly have the types of intelligence that human beings do. That's the future of what we're looking at. And with all of that, what I, what I tell people is, let's try to, as lawyers to preserve the fundamental values of justice that, we're, that are associated with our profession. When you look at the left column, you see all the things that could go wrong. And certainly all of these things will go wrong in the future. There will be snake oil. There will be fraud in people selling AI systems and robots. But hopefully as a profession, we can promote the values that are in the right column. So with that, I, uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, the, my contact information is in the materials and um, um, the, the program materials that I gave to you are one, my latest article on privacy and security. Two was uh, a, a, a last summer's uh, article on privacy and security challenges of artificial intelligence and robotics. And three, the article on product liability and preventing um, uh, managing the risk of product liability. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and move back into face mode. So d does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I do, Steve. Um, Go ahead, Jim. Okay, so one of the issues that you uh, pointed to towards the end is is about transparency. And, and I understand that the struggle being the, between those who want to see uh, a fully uh, transparent availability uh, or access to the engines that, that run uh, AI systems to give uh, outcomes. I mean, you know, for famously related to sentencing, for example. But if you pull back and look at the transparency issue more broadly across sort of all AI systems, 
where is that debate happening, right? Because we have, we have um, on, on the other side of that struggle, uh, companies that want to create systems, but they need to have some incentive to do that. And if everything's going to be laid open um, as the price for doing it, it, it may be difficult to get there. So where is it, where is that debate happening and, and where is it at at the moment? I, I think the short answer is everywhere. Um, in other words, in the corporate boardrooms, you have people talking about this issue at, in the development process and people hopefully are saying to each other, if we're going to develop this product or service, we wanna make sure that we understand how this works in reality, understand the factors it's using to create decisions and making sure that we don't have biased outcomes from our system. So corporate boardrooms is one place. Um, the halls of academia is another place because there are a lot of academics who are looking at this issue and starting to create publications and programs about these very things, especially the criminal justice context. You have people in, uh, um, in government who are thinking about these types of issues as well. So it, it's everywhere and, and in the bar, in the organized bar, all of our programs, we're talking about these types of issues. So okay. where is it happening? It's this, this, these discussions are happening everywhere.